So what is your area of expertise? I'm a cognitive neuroscientist. I do Most of my work has to do with uh, top-down regulation, which basically um, means, in, in simple words, how what we think translates into uh, bodily activity bodily activity, neurophysiological activity, physiological activity that actually makes it happen. So as opposed to, uh, if most people look at um, how do you see and they look at photons that hit the retina and, and how that sort of turns into a picture, I actually look at the other process. If you think about a particular uh, thing in your mind, if you, think, if you think that you're seeing something in your mind, what is the representation of that thing when it starts from your mind and how that changes what, hap what happens on your retina? Uh, so, so it's it's sort of a reverse engineering way um, uh, to think about what starts in like sort of headquarters. In this particular case, your cortex would uh, you know cascade all the way down and sort of marinate your system in this particular idea or notion that something is happening, and how your system would respond to that and make something happen. Uh, although there is no uh, physical stimulus that that makes it happen. So either it comes in from from within you know from within you, or it is something that you have experienced before and you're sort of recreating it in your mind. Uh, a lot of my research has to do with these kind of um, uh, approaches and the science that makes it happen. So, for example? For example, placebos, for example, hypnosis, for example, the role of suggestion, for example, motivation, mindset, all these things would fall into this category. You study what is commonly thought of as the power of suggestion. What does suggestion have to do with meditation? And why should meditation scientists be interested in it? So, I mean, technically, I think that suggestion, the word suggestion, uh, is a word that is of extreme, I would say, critical um, importance to the field of meditation. Because um, meditation, in general, thrives on forms of suggestion. It, it could be self-suggestion. It could be um, induction of self-regulatory um, uh, processes. But at the end, at the core level, I think that suggestion is a... Um, um, uh, a prim primary construct of trying to understand what is happening at a higher abstraction level in terms of what we are talking about when it comes to modulation of the self, when it comes to trying to rethink, reprogram, uh, reappreciate, reapprise our own monitoring. The, when, when it comes to monitoring, when it, when it comes to trying to understand what we're doing and sort of putting a camera that is looking at ourselves and looking at that particular monitor in order to learn something about our own behavior, uh, our own purpose, our own intentions, um, suggestion becomes key because in many ways uh, our behavior is governed by parameters that we often neglect to think about in terms of something that is not self-initiated. So mostly when we are brushing our teeth, we're doing this because uh, we, have, uh, we are very high-minded about the, the um, you know, uh, uh, quality or the, or, the, or the health of our dental um, um, uh, construction or, or you know, whatever you, know, you, you want to call it. But if somebody comes to you and, and actually gives you a suggestion that uh, brushing your teeth is actually not good for you, um, you have a conflict beginning to brew and you have to resolve it somehow. And sometimes you would uh, sort of resort to either cognitive uh, approaches to thinking about it, sometimes you would resort to emotional, but the fact of the matter is that suggestions are all around us. Sometimes the suggestions would come from our physicians, from our spouses, from our friends, from other people who, that, that, that we meet. And a suggestion has the power to actually change not just our thinking, but our physiological systems. It has the power to change our worldviews. It has the power to reshape and remold uh, the kind of environment that we think that we are in. So reality, in a way, is a function, among other things, of the suggestions that we're accepting, either suggestions that we give ourselves or suggestions that we're willing to accept from um, individuals or cues in our environment. So in many ways, suggestion is a very strong modulators of our subjective experience. And because in meditation there is a big emphasis on subjectivity versus objectivity and trying to sort of find some kind of a um, um, balance or some kind of a way to weigh these things out and, and filter them through, um, understanding the role of suggestion in perception, in sensation, in emotional regulation and so on becomes very important to understanding the human experience. 
You say that being suggestible is a good thing. Why? First of all, to be highly suggestible, in my opinion, is a gift. Um, because you actually have the tools, you have the biological tools, you have the mental tools to shape, mold, and, and sort of govern um, the reality that you want to create or the reality that you can create and, and live in. A lot of people um, construe suggestibility as vulnerability. They, they take the word suggestibility and they think that that's the equivalence of feeble-mindedness or something like that. But that's not at all what we're talking about. We're talking about the ability to get absorbed, the ability to pay attention to the exclusion of other things. So to focus on some things to the exclusion of other things. This creates a, a, basically a selection procedure whereby you can focus or concentrate on particular elements and let go of other elements. These other elements, if they're distracting, if they're not helping a particular cause, it's a great boon, it's a, it's a huge advantage to do these kind of things. This is not just about pain regulation or your ability to deal with a particular hardship. It is also your ability to connect with higher abstract modes of thinking. It's your ability to be creative. It's your ability to, to find solutions to problems and, um, and so on. In a, in a nutshell, suggestibility and certainly hypnotic suggestibility, which is a particular form of suggestibility that I have uh, worked with in, for many years, is something that we look for in individuals in order to be able to study the, 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 this kind of construction of suggestibility in, in the lab. And what we do is we look at people and we ask them to do all kinds of very difficult tasks, tasks that would be very difficult to do to any normal person, but by giving them specific suggestions that are all in their mind, in the sense that there's actually nothing happening perceptually on a screen, but we're giving them a suggestion that something is happening, they're able to hallucinate these changes, and as a result, solve problems that are very, very difficult to do perceptually. These things suggest to us that they're not just um, this is not role enactment, this is not social compliance. They're actually changing brain activity in a sufficiently reliable way as to view the world differently and as a result of that solve problems that would be impossible for other people who are unable to hallucinate in this way, in fashion to solve these problems. When you do a series of experiments like that in the lab and when you have pro appropriate controls, you found out that, or you find out that, or I find out that, that you know, that these are as real as having people be in the lab and given these cues physically. So the fact that you can create a world where physical cues are missing, but you are actually inserting them, you're introducing them with your mind, that's a very meaningful finding because in a way it suggests that these people can create an alternative reality that is as real to them as the real world. And in that particular mindset, they're capable of thriving, solving problems, making decisions, uh, and, you know, uh, experiencing certain affects and emotions that are not necessarily available to them in the objective world. Uh, and only people who are highly suggestible can do that. So in that regard, I view them as gifted. I view them as endowed with special skills. What's the importance of this research on suggestibility to the field of medicine? One, one, practical, one practical way to, to connect it to medicine, to healing, to curing, would be uh, placebo effects, placebo responses, whereby what you think um, triggers or, or, or starts a process that allows you to heal or allows your physiology to act in a particular way, for example, to boost your immune system. Now, again, I just want to be clear, we're not talking here about uh, you know, shrinking tumors for cancer with placebos. I mean, we're not talking here about lowering cholesterol with, uh, by giving people uh, water. We're, we're talking about situations that um, are, you know, where anxiety, where, where emotions, where um, you know, mild to moderate uh, psychological um, conditions play a role, um, and how placebos and how placebo affects placebo responses can actually um, change the physiology in the direction of a healthy, normal, whatever that means, uh, behavior. This has been shown with neurofeedback. This has been shown with even open label placebos. When you give people placebos and you tell them this is a placebo, but it's going to help you, and people improve with lower back pain, with ADHD, with uh, migraines, with irritable bowel syndrome. So, I mean, these are completely documented um, uh, studies that are um, done in the medical milieu, but they, of course, uh, you know, beyond the, the, the practicalities of, of clinical science, we also have 
um, uh, applications that have to do with uh, enhanced cognition and, and, and performing better, feeling better, and so on. You opened your talk yesterday saying, the public is being bombarded by all kinds of neuroscience mumbo jumbo. What did you mean by mumbo jumbo? And can you give us some examples? Yeah, I mean, I think that the main problem that we have today is neuroenchantment. Uh, people are completely enchanted by anything that has to do with the brain. We have rotating brain, we have sliced up brain, we see brains in, in images, we, we talk about brain activations. And I think the um, unsophisticated uh, layperson or people who are extremely intelligent but not necessarily versed in the technicalities of how these images are produced or what is the process that goes on behind the scenes are likely to be disappointed or somewhat disillusioned or maybe a lot disillusioned if they realize that many of these activations, many of these images that we see are actually not as scientific as we mean them to be. So when we say neuroscience, the emphasis, it's the juxtaposition of brain and science, it's the science of the brain, but actually we are really at our, you know, this is a very nascent, a very embryonic uh, field and many of the things that we produce there are sort of speculative and, and, and very, uh, I would say, immature at best. What do you think is so compelling about these images? I think that, you know, just like uh, other imaging devices uh, historically throughout the years, the telescope or, or you know, the x-ray machine, you know, when the x-ray machine was uh, first discovered, the, the big uh, headlines in the German newspapers was that this is the end of privacy because now everyone can get one and you can see your, you know, neighbors, neck, you know, behind the wall having sex. So it, the, the, whole, the whole notion of imaging devices is, is we are very visual uh, animals, humans are very visual animals. And, one third of our brain just about is dedicated to processing visual information. So the second you give people visual information, they play with it, they, they, they run with it. Um, it's very appealing to look at things and particularly things that sort of make your own core humanity. So there's something about a religious experience when you look at your own brain or when you're able to see it rotating or when you can, can see it in action or functioning. So I think that beyond just an image, there's also a little bit of a self-reflective kind of process trying to tell us who we are. And the brain sort of fits, not just in terms of its uh, pictorial representation, but also in terms of its symbolic meaning. Can neural imaging read our minds? And if not yet, is it just a matter of time? Neuroimaging is a very exciting field. I mean, you, the fact that you can see what's happening you know, inside the brain when people are thinking, when they're solving problems, when they're regulating their emotions and so on, uh, that's exciting, period. It, you know, whether you can extend it to the point that you can actually see what people are thinking about, whether you can read their mind, whether they can tell if they're telling the truth, uh, you know, things of that nature, we're not there yet. Are we likely to be there next year, five years from now, ten years from now? It's very difficult to predict, certainly the future. But we are getting closer to understanding more about what you know, is happening in the brain and so on. The reason we cannot tell today um, whether people are telling the truth or what number they're thinking about uh, in a particular scenario is not just technological. This is not just the problem. It's not just a, qu a question of do we have a higher magnetic field instead of three Tesla, we're going to have seven Tesla. It's a conceptual problem of understanding what are the networks doing? How is it being represented? What is the encoding like? And, and so on. So it, these are questions that have to do with the gestalt understanding of what the brain does, as well as the micro understanding of what a specific network does and how it connects and functions with other networks. So it's not just a technological question. It's not just a physical question of having higher magnification or faster computers. It's also a conceptual, cognitive, deep, understanding mechanistic question of how does the brain do it, which we don't fully understand. So the, the likelihood of this you know, turning out to be uh, resolved tomorrow or next week is very low. Uh, I cannot speak about what's going to happen you know, into the far future because we just don't know, but it's probably going to take its sweet time before it unravels and folds.